I'm really excited to uh, be able to be here with you and talk about something that I'm really passionate about and something that I think not only do I now have the passion, but I have better tools to really fuel my passion. So I'm really excited to be able to hear talk to you about Maculogics, like Carrie said, um, and the uh, instrument, the Adapt DX. And before I start talking about what the instrument is, I want to just share a case with you. And this is something that I've become extremely familiar with in my practice. And so it's a patient that comes in like this, a 65-year-old female that's 20-20 vision, no family history of AMD, non-smoker, not really worried about this person. You take a look inside their eye and you see the picture here and you just, you really don't see much. But then I kind of circled there for you. There's just an area where there might be a couple of very, very small little drusen or some other very, very minimal change that usually we would look at that and say, really no big deal, not very concerned, don't need to worry about that. So we'll say this person has very subtle drusen. You do an OCT, as we oftentimes do, and it's completely unremarkable. Even if you've got the right slice and you're going through that area, you don't see anything. But now what I do in my practice is I do dark adaptation. And what I've been finding out, and I'll share with you some really, to me, surprising statistics of my own practice, what I'm finding is a lot of these people have abnormal dark adaptation. And really what that means is this person has macular degeneration. And so now we have a person that our diagnosis is subclinical AMD. So, you know, we've heard of things like pre-diabetes or we treat pre-parametric glaucoma. But do we think about subclinical macular degeneration? And I would, I would argue that most of us probably don't because until now we didn't have a way to find it. So it was something you can make up a word for, but there was nothing you can do about it. So that's why I'm really excited about this because I know, you know, that macular degeneration is a major threat to your patient's vision. And what I would contend to you is that we are in the driver's seat. It's not the retina specialist that's doing the anti-VEGF injections because once patients get there, it's already, a, it's already not going to be a very good ending. When we see people before they even have the clinical signs of macular degeneration and we can identify it, those are the people that will ultimately do much better. And those are the people that we have sitting in our offices. So, you know, what we need to realize is how many people there are with macular degeneration. If you add up, Patients with diabetic retinopathy plus patients with glaucoma, it equals less than the number of people with macular degeneration. So how many of you have a perimeter and OCT so that you can find glaucoma early, right? Well, the number of people with glaucoma pales in comparison to the people with macular degeneration. So shouldn't we want to find macular degeneration as early as we try to find glaucoma? You find glaucoma early, you put someone on a drop, and you try to prevent progression. And I would contend we need to be thinking the exact same way when it comes to macular degeneration. Treatment for macular degeneration, like I said, should start with us and what we do, not once someone has wet AMD and they, and, and they need injections. So if you start looking at, you know, as people get older, and we, we know this, a higher percentage of patients will have macular degeneration. And I would actually argue that these numbers are awfully conservative that more than one out of eight, and I'll share with you the statistics from my practice, that I would contend that more than one out of eight people over the age of 60 actually have age-related macular degeneration. And so that's more than one out of eight that we need to be doing something about. We need to find and we need to do something about. And the reason that we need to find and do something about it is because when you think about what do you do about macular degeneration, you think, well, what does a retina specialist do? How do they treat wet AMD? I'm not so concerned about that. I want to know what do we do before somebody needs the retina specialist? Because the startling statistic, and that's what this slide is saying, is by the time someone needs an injection, by the time someone develops wet AMD, almost 80% of the time their vision is already worse than 20-50, and 40% of the time they're legally blind. So they're legally blind at diagnosis. That means we're not finding it early enough. And the reason we're not finding it early enough is we're not using tests that are sensitive and specific to find macular degeneration, identify it earlier so that we can follow these patients more closely, and start implementing measures like nutrition, lifestyle, other things that we can do for our patients to be preventative of them ending up ever needing treatment in the first place. And if they do need treatment, we'll find them earlier because we're already following them more closely. So, you know, what did ARIDS and ARIDS-2 tell us? ARIDS and ARIDS-2 told us we can decrease the progression to wet AMD or vision loss by about 25 to 30% with the right supplement. What does that mean, though? That means two-thirds of people that were going to get worse still get worse. If you let them get to that stage, that intermediate or late stage of dry AMD, majority, if they're going to get worse, are already going to get worse. 
So what I would tell you is we need to identify earlier and prevent that. What do we know about the anti-VEGF injections? We know that anti-VEGF injections can basically create some stability, but what the studies are now saying is it's for five to seven years, and after that, patients get worse. And what stability means is from their initial VA when they need treatment. So what that should tell us is if we can identify people earlier and we know when they need treatment earlier so they start out with good vision, they'll end up with better vision. So I keep saying these things that are really prevention, prevention, and the only way we can prevent is if we know in whom we need to prevent. So this is a quote by a retina specialist in Houston who, pretty well known in ophthalmology circles, involved in most of the different retina clinical trials, and he says that many AMD patients are arriving at our practice with unnecessary vision loss. Ideally, these patients would see their primary eye physician and be diagnosed earlier. That's us. See us, be diagnosed earlier, and by the time they get to him, not have as bad a vision. They don't like creating bad results, and I think it's in our hands to really help patients have better results. So the instrument that I use in my practice is this. It's the ADAPT DX, and so it is a very simple objective tool to measure dark adaptation that functionally correlates with macular dystrophies and macular degeneration. To me, what's really impressive is this instrument is over 90% sensitive and over 90% specific in identifying macular degeneration. So it finds it when it's there, and it doesn't find it when it's not there. Two really important things. And so what we know from different trials and papers that have been published is this will find macular degeneration in many cases at least three years before you would actually see any clinical signs of the disease. So do you want to wait to diagnose glaucoma until someone has a, a, a fixation threatened nasal step? No. You want to find it earlier. So we should be thinking the same way about macular degeneration. Let's find it at its earliest stage so that we can do something about it and prevent the bad outcomes. So in the instrument, there's two different testing protocols. The first is a rapid test. And the way I think of that is kind of like a screening. And if somebody dark adapts within the first six and a half minutes, that's normal. If it takes longer than six and a half minutes, we know that's abnormal and indicative of that person having macular degeneration. Kind of like doing a screening visual field, right? You do a screening visual field, either it's normal or we haven't come back into a full threshold visual field. So if the rapid test here is abnormal, I have my patients come back to do the extended test. It can take up to 20 minutes, depending on the severity of their macular degeneration. The more severe the macular degeneration, the longer it'll take for that person to dark adapt. So it's really, it's like a thresholding test. You can, you can actually gauge progression over time to see if someone's macular degeneration is actually getting worse and having more of an effect on their vision. This is just one of the papers that was published that looked at about 125 people with AMD and about 20 without. And this is how the numbers were come up with for sensitivity and specificity. So if you identify someone that has macular change on photography and then you run a dark adaptation, 90% of the time the dark adaptation will be abnormal. If you take people that are normal clinically and then look at them in dark adaptation, this says that 90% of the time it'll identify them as normal as well. So very sensitive, very specific for any test. I think that's something that's really important. Now something that oftentimes we as optometrists think is important is, well that sounds great Jeff, but what about our colleagues in ophthalmology? Because if that's where we're ultimately gonna be referring patients, what do ophthalmologists think of this? So if you're worried about that, which I've contend we don't necessarily need to be, but if you are, then take a look at this. These are the guidelines from AAO, American Academy of Ophthalmology, and they say that one of the first symptoms of macular degeneration that ophthalmologists or eye care providers should be looking for are difficulties in dark adaptation. So in their guidelines, the standards that they create, they are specifically calling out dark adaptation as something that is important for identifying macular degeneration. So this is not just something that we as optometrists should believe in, but it's something that ophthalmologists clearly believe in as well and think is important enough to be in their guidelines. Now, one thing I want to be very clear about is once somebody has abnormal dark adaptation, that is not a risk factor for macular degeneration. That means they have macular degeneration. So I do genetic testing in my office. I check macular pigment optical density. Those are both risk factors. That does not say yes or no. This is a test that says yes or no. It absolutely identifies macular degeneration. So it is not a risk factor. It is the earliest manifestation of the disease. And I think that's a, a really important distinction to realize. We're not saying, well, maybe it'll happen. If someone has abnormal dark adaptation, it has happened. They have macular degeneration. So does doing something like this bring value to your practice? Does it bring value to your patients? So important to realize for doing the test 
It's something that you, for this test, you don't need any uh, prior dark ad ad adaptation. You don't need to sit in a room for a while before you do the test. Patients do not need to be dilated. It's just as easy as doing a visual field test. It's very, very easy, completely automated for, for your technician or staff or even you to be able to run. It gives an objective output. It gives a period of time that will tell you whether that is normal or abnormal. It is a reimbursable test. So just like it's about the same footprint as a visual field, it reimburses about the same, and oftentimes it takes about the same amount of time as doing a visual field. So reimbursable medically, there are ICD-10 codes that allow for reimbursement for this, one of which is abnormal dark adaptation. Well, it's pretty easy to ask a patient, do you, do you not like driving at night? Do you have problems when it's nighttime? And yes, okay, you have abnormal dark adaptation. So it's actually quite easy to be able to bill for medically, and there's codes there to allow you to do it. Now, as far as what it does for us in our practices, once you identify that someone has macular degeneration, that brings along a whole other host of things that we need to do for them. That's no longer just a once a year patient that we do our, our fairly routine exam. There's all sorts of other tests that we're going to want to be doing. There may be even be optical products or other things that we need to recommend to these people because we now know they have macular degeneration. So, for your practice, for, for your patients, this is good because we can detect something earlier and intervene earlier. I would imagine that most of you have, have some experience and believe in nutritional supplementation. Well, this tells you these are people that absolutely need nutritional supplementation because they have macular degeneration. Few people would argue that patients with AMD don't need supplements. Most of us would say they do. So now we know these people need supplements and we're able to help preserve their, their vision and their overall quality of vision, quality of life. Good for your practice because instead of someone coming in once a year as a routine exam, now they're in your office maybe two or three times a year and you're doing other tests that we should be doing that we're able to bill for. So now all of a sudden this isn't an 80 or $100 a year patient. AMD patients are worth up to, it depends on whose estimates you look at, up to around $600 a year to your practice. So now that patient's worth about seven times as much to your practice as they would have been had you not identified that they have early macular degeneration. So, Gary Kerman is an OD in Pennsylvania that's been using this technology for a couple years, and what he, he's gone back and looked at his metrics. Instead of his average patient generating $80 every 18 months, he now generates from patients that he's able to identify as having macular generation about $650 a year. And so it's a huge boost to your revenue. And the cool thing about it is it's a boost to your revenue because you're doing the right thing. So you're identifying a disease process, you're doing the right thing for your patients, and usually when you do things like that, you prosper. Now at the beginning of the 10 minutes, I mentioned my real life experience with this. And so what, I did, what I've started doing is I have a series of 40 so far consecutive patients over age 60 with no clinical findings. Meaning I do my routine exam, they're dilated, I look in, everything looks completely normal. I then do a OCT and dark adaptation on them. So far, 12 of the 40 have had abnormal dark adaptation. So 12 out of those 40 patients that I thought were completely normal, as it turns out, they have subclinical macular degeneration. By the way, I'm, as I said, I'm doing OCT on all these patients. None of them have had any drusen on OCT that I didn't see on exam. And when I look at the OCT metrics, just looking at age-based norms for overall retinal thickness, it's all normal. So there's no other test that I have or I could be doing that would be telling me these patients definitively have macular degeneration. So what I'll tell you for me is that it's completely changed the way that I'm looking at these patients. Because now I know who has macular degeneration as opposed to before, I was assuming so many people didn't. So it's really thrust me into doing things quite a bit differently. Yeah? It does. If someone has abnormal dark, well, if so, so the question is, if someone has abnormal dark adaptation, does that mean they definitively have AMD? There are several other things that can cause abnormal dark adaptation. Some sort of macular dystrophy or retinal dystrophy can cause it, or a generalized uh, vitamin A deficiency. That's about it. So unless you have one of those two things, usually you'll know, but unless you have one of those two things, it is age-related macular degeneration. So with supplementation, have I seen a reverse? So no. Um, so this is fairly new. I've been doing this for about three months. And so, you know, have me back in a year and I'll tell you what, what I'm seeing. Um, but these are all people that I'm now starting on supplementation. I, you know, I'm a, any of you that have heard me talk before, you know I'm, I'm an avid advocate for supplementation nutrition. 
That being said, I don't think everybody needs, needs supplementation. These patients do. You'd be hard pressed to make a good argument to say, well, these people, they're, they're probably going to do fine, so you don't really need to do anything. Have since Haven't retested since started. Did you do MPOD on these people? So no, I'm not doing MPOD. I've done MPOD on some of them. And what I'll tell you, what I've seen from MPOD, so I, I didn't include that in this, this series that I'm creating. But what I've found in MPOD is it does not correlate. So I've had some people that have pretty good MPOD that have poor dark adaptation and then reverse. I'll have some people that have um, that, are, that are the opposite. So uh, and again, MPOD's a risk factor. We've all have had patients with AMD with pretty good MPOD or really bad MPOD that don't develop AMD. So it's a risk factor versus something being a definitive diagnostic marker. Yes? Are you testing both eyes? And if you were, of the 12, uh, you know, how many had just one eye as opposed to both? Yeah, so for, my, for the series that I've created, I'm just testing one eye. And if you look at literature, it basically says you only need to test one eye. Really, the only reason to test both eyes is if you're doing the extended test and you're staging and you want to very critically look at each eye to see how, the, how each eye is responding. But literature will tell you that if you test one eye and it's abnormal, that you don't need to test the fellow eye. Yes? Can you explain to the physiology of what exactly is happening when someone's dark adaptation yeah, so, so the question is, what's happening? Why do they have abnormal dark adaptation? So let me, I'll make it really simple, and then we can discuss more later if you want to come up. Um, so basically what's happening is when you start to develop drusen, that's not the, the earliest change in macular degeneration. You start to get basal laminar and linear deposits that basically clog up Brooks membrane. And so what you, the reason you have an abnormal dark adaptation is because you have a deficiency in vitamin A transport. Okay? So once you have these deposits that are creating this, this wall, this cement along Brooks membrane, vitamin A is no longer allowed to get through. So you create this localized um, vitamin A deficiency, which is what creates the, the change in dark adaptation. That's kind of the boiled down version of what it is. So are cells actually dying or anything? Okay. Are cells dying? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Are you no. So, so, no. So dark adaptation doesn't tell you cells are dying. It's telling you that the vitamin A is not getting through. <coughs> right. So when I said that there's some dystrophies and degenerations that will cause a retinitis pigmentosa is one of the other ones. So I have, I've got about a half a dozen patients that I see with, with RP. And so when I first got this instrument, I thought, well, just to, just to satisfy my intellectual curiosity, I want to see how these people do. And what I very quickly realized is they do very poorly. And so on those people, my tech hates when I have RP patients come in because I say, oh, let's test this person. Let's just see. And she's like, doc, don't you already know the answer? I do, but I had to show myself that. So yeah, RP patients are, have an abnorm abnormal dark adaptation. Yes? So you said that if there's an abnormal finding in one eye, you don't need to do the other eye. Correct. But it's not necessarily only going to progress equally. Correct. So how often are you missing it if you're only doing one eye and the other eye might have a problem? Yeah, it's a good question. So basically, am I missing some if I'm only testing one eye? So you're making my case even better than I would have made my case, because now you're suggesting more than 30% of my patients that I thought didn't have AMD might. Or that you have to do at least do both eyes to find out. Yeah. So again, for the series that I'm doing, I'm not testing both eyes. And again, just basing that on literature, you're right. There'll be some. There may be one or two out of, I, I'm, my goal is to get 100 patients. And so maybe there's one or two out of that 100 that I will have missed. So, but the whole idea of a screening test is something that's quick and easy. And so, you know, for my sake as a private practitioner, I, because I know the science, I'm able to easily rationalize myself. I only need to do this for one eye. And if the one eye is normal, I don't need to do the other, and vice versa. If one eye is abnormal, then there's certainly no reason to check the other eye. Any other, any other questions? These are great questions. And they, by the way, these are all questions that before I started actively using this technology, these were the questions I had. Right? Like, I'm not someone that someone can just come and tell me, hey, this, this works, it's great, use it. You know, I got to read about it, I got to be confident, I need to make sure. And so, you know, hesitantly, I decided, well, let, let's try this. Based on, you know, science is pretty, pretty good, let's try this. And now I'm, I'm, I'm pretty enthusiastic about it because, you know, I've shown myself how much I can find that I would not have otherwise seen. There was another hand. Are the uh, results confounded by cataracts? No. No. All right, so key takeaways, I think, are number one, to realize how prevalent AMD is. Diabetic retinopathy plus glaucoma do not equal AMD. There's more AMD than those two together. So we need to realize how important this is 
uh, from, a, from a big picture, uh, and that proactive detection and management, that's us, right? That's, that's not what the retina specialist is necessarily interested in, but I think that's what most of us are interested in. And this is a new tool for us to be able to find something early, manage it, and really help our patients preserve their vision and, and more importantly, preserve their overall quality of life.